Hello, everybody. Welcome to LA Times. This is Big Paul. We got a special guest today. We got Mike Sandoval, aka Mikey, formerly from West Side La Habra, Tiny Locals. Is that right, Mike? Yes. All right, Mike. We're gonna break down his story today. In case you don't know, La Habra, La Habra specifically, Barrio La Habra, and to more specifically, West Side La Habra is an old neighborhood in Orange County, one of the oldest. It used to be full of orange fields and campos and orange pickers used to be here back in the day and home of the Gabrielino Indians and, and all kinds of history here, both bad and criminal. Mike, you could say, has lived on both sides of that. So welcome to the show, Mike. Thank you. All right, Mike. First we want to get to is where and how did you grow up as a kid? I grew up right here in La Habra. I was born in La Mirada in 1982. I grew up right here in La Habra as a kid with my grandma and my dad. My, my mom had left us as a kid due to heroin addiction, but my dad stuck with it. And even though he was young and, and he was from Avada himself, he was actually from the east side. And, uh, you know, growing up like that, you know, he did his thing too, but he also tried to lead us the right way. You know, he tried to put us in sports and, you know, try, try to teach us what not to do. But I guess at the same time doing it himself, but kind of telling us not to do it. But, you know, he was, to me, he was a good role model, you know. Others might say different, but... You know, that's that's my take on it. He was always there for me, uh, no matter what what I was into or what I was doing. He was always there. Yeah, and then um, La Habra, at the time you were growing up, you know, I'm sure like all of us, we all ran around the streets as kids and everything, but could you tell us about La Habra? I mean, it had a strong criminal element back in the day, you know, um, probably one of the most numerous gang members in North, North Orange County, you know, one of the biggest. Uh, can you tell us about the streets of La Habra at that time? Yeah, the streets of La Habra in the 90s, that's when I started, you know, messing around with gangs. They were always prominently there at school and everywhere you went, but it was always just friends, and it wasn't really a gang, I guess, element. It was just more of a, of a friend element. But when it comes to that, you know, gangbang is involved and you do have a choice if you're going to get in or you're going to stay on the sidelines or what you're going to do. And I chose, you know, I chose to get in. And in the 90s, it was real rough in La Habra. Gangs were everywhere. We were we were the, the prominent, you know, we were the biggest gang in La Habra with with, um, you know, many cliques. I was, you know, I was a youngster at that time, and it didn't take too long, though, before the criminal element started getting in. You know, there was numerous shootings, numerous uh, murders, numerous everything in the 90s. It was, La Habra was a very, very hot spot. Yeah, I know La Habra, you had different gangs. You had the Pee Wees, Inanos, Chicos, I mean, Tiny Locos, uh, Chiquitas. I mean, I could go on and on. And then later right. on, you had uh, the Monos, which at that time were like more Mexicanos, but now they're more Chicanos. Later on, like, you know, getting the modern times, you have the Campo. But then you had the original camp, which were the Westsiders. So you grew up in all that. So it's almost like you're going to go two ways. You're either going to be a gang member or not, man. It, it, was, it was a rough time, especially when you know La Habra. Like I said, everybody's Campo, everybody's related. Everybody, it's a it's a city four by four, four miles by four miles, but mm -hmm. loaded with gang members, you know. So I almost hate to ask you, it's evident, but eventually you became a gang member, bro. Why? Why did you become a gang member? And then what what was the influence that led you that way? Well, I became a gang member just because those were my friends. And at the time, I used to hang around with the older crew. They were, everybody was older than me. I was always the youngest. I was always the smallest. And where I grew up at my house, from my house, it was actually a hop, skip, and a jump to your left, 
to Ward Street, which is considered east side La Habra. And not too, not too far to the right was, you know, all the West Siders. And growing up, the, the dudes from Ward Street, you know, the, which is actually an enemy gang, but actually where I grew up in their territory, they used to mess with me when I was younger. You know, and my dad, my dad is an OG, you know, from, from the east side. So, you know, I used to look at that and be like, man, these dudes show no respect. You know, even though I was young, I still had that, you know, mentality of respect and disrespect. And they used to show disrespect. And so, so I went the other way, you know, and I used to hang around a lot of older dudes, like I said, I was always out of my element. I was always the youngest one. I was always the smallest one. And when I got jumped in, you know, of course, I was a minor. And it's crazy because now thinking back at it, all the dudes that jumped me in were older. You know, they were at least 18 and over. Um, and, yeah, that's basically how I got in. And it evolved, you know, very, very rapidly and very, very quickly. And drugs were always, uh, 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 you know, heavily involved as well, all the time. And then, Mike, uh, how did your dad feel when you were going into the rival neighborhood? And, and uh, again, like, you, you, you went to the west side, which was the biggest side. Uh, the Ward Street was smaller. Like, uh, right. what led you to go to the west side and not go to your dad's side? Was your dad uh, disappointed? He was very, very disappointed. You know, my dad has always been, um, you know, Billy Bad Butt, right? Growing up. And, and I looked at him as such. And I still, even though he's older and more frail today, I still look at him the same. You know, he's, he's um, you know, he's that guy. And I remember one time as a youngster, and he was chilling with some guy um, from Brown Brotherhood. He was our neighbor. So they're chilling, kicking back, drinking. And the, you know, the guy was telling my dad in front of me, like, hey, do you know your son's a West Sider? And my dad put his beard down. You know, he must have been pretty buzzed. And he was like, is that right, Mule? You're a West Sider? And I told him, yeah, dad. And he started, he just went off. He said, do you know how many wars and how much bloodshed and, and I understand all that you know and I do you know a lot of his friends you know got killed during the, those times and you know I just I had nothing to say but that it is what it is you know but yeah he was <laughs> very disappointed very disappointed yeah as you, as you entered that life you're in now did you have to get jumped in and if so could you tell us that day I did have to get jumped in and we were um we were actually up here on Se 2nd Street and Cyprus, and uh, I was just chilling with, um, there's a, a family there, you know, a pretty big family, a lot of brothers, and I was chilling with them, and, you know, they finally asked me, like, what's up, do you want to get jumped in? And I said, yeah, and basically that's that's where it went down, right there in the little uh, parking lot. Um, it was actually, like, just... Not a parking lot, just where people would, would park for, for the apartments right there. So, yeah. yeah. I think I know exactly where you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. And the family you're talking about. And the about. family, right. <laughs> right. A big family here. Yeah. So, so, uh, so time goes on. Time goes on. As you're now officially a gang member, man, you start, uh, who were your enemies and what was the first dealings with them? The enemies were, you know, of course um the the east side but it was kind of dying out already you know the east side was already dying out already and um they were kind of transitioning to a gang called war street which is on the east side and the monos were the enemies and the campo you know they they're they're old as well and and they were the enemies and um i remember going with uh one of my homeboys, he was a little older than me, and we went to to a street where the monos were heavily, heavily at that time. And we went with the bike, and we went, you know, with a couple, um, you know, nothing too heavy artillery, but we went, you know, 
with a couple guns and we went in our bikes and you know we just started we saw a party and we made sure that it was you know a gang and not just a family partying and and yeah and we let off and basically that was one of my first um first one of the first times i pulled the trigger wow wow so i'm sure as you got in you got to know all the different gangs on the west side um, people don't know the West Side of La Habra, there's many gangs, but they're all united, you know. Sometimes there's some eternal conflict, we know, you know, but but usually it gets straightened out, man. So, mm -hmm. uh, man, what, what kind of stuff did you see? What did you see the other gangs doing? And, uh, man, just uh, was it havoc back then or, you know, in your in your heyday, you know? We'll get to everything else you're doing now, you know, but, uh, you know, like, man, how was those times, brother? It was, it was, and a lot of those times, um, looking back at it, it was straight crazy, you know, it was chaos, it was crazy, but at the time, I loved it, at the time, I loved it, at the time, I didn't want nothing else except to be in it, you know, at the time, uh, back then, there was, there was, you know, weekends where we would have party on the whole street, you know, and we would just go from house to house to house, like block parties, you know, and and all the all the homeboys and all the homegirls, you know, they would be there. And I think what I loved what I loved most about it was, you could see that there was there was real. Well, at the time, I felt like a real bond, you know, a real love, a re a real, um, you know, cariño with everybody. Whatever you need, don't trip. I got it. You know, you need some something. Whatever, whatever it was, you know, and and that mixed with with drugs and partying and drinking. You know, it was just, to me, that was the life. And that was kind of the more, the downside, you know, like where you could, um, I guess, take your hat off, you know, and chill and party. So those were, those were the heydays. Those were the, you know, the times that I remember was like, wow, it was a trip because you used to be able to, you know, party anywhere you wanted, you know, on the street and the whole street is, basically gang members, you know, but at the time you don't look at it as gang members. You look at it as they're your friends, you know, and, but you got to be ready. Once you go back out there into the street and roam around on your bike, you know, back then, of course, I was a minor, didn't drive, stole a lot of cars, but, you know, I didn't, um, didn't own one, you know, so the bike, the, the beach cruiser or whatever it was I was riding was always the best the best way to go, you know, and you had to be strapped back then. There was no, you know, oh, I forgot it at home type of thing because at the time the mentality was it's better to get caught with one than without one because if you get caught with one, you might go to juvenile hall, you might do 60, 90 days, whatever it was, but if you get caught with that one, you know, by an enemy, that could be, that could be your life. Yeah, it's crazy. Um you know, knowing about La Habra, uh, for those of you out there who don't know, it's it's a wild city. It's on the corner of L.A. and Orange County. It's where Whittier Boulevard, Whittier Boulevard basically ends in La Habra. And on one side, La Habra, although it's separated by some hills, on one side, on the left side, you got South Side Whittier. You got East Side Winter Park. You got Fullerton, Topherstown. And then on one side, you got kind of the East Side La Habra. Then over the hill, you got a... Uh, you know, La Puente and all those gangs and stuff like that. Did you guys ever have dealings or beef with the other cities around? Or was it strictly La Habra internal war? At the time, it was strictly La Habra internal war, internal war because we didn't really know nothing else except La Habra. You know, I didn't really learn about, you know, enemies in, in this city or that city until I started going um, to actually you know, a, a real good, a gang that we used to be, you know, real, real close to was La Jolla. So when we would go over there to their neighborhood, you know, we, we had all reins to their neighborhood and they kind of had it with ours. You know, we were real close like that. So we would go over there and, and they would kind of tell us like, watch out for these people, watch out for these people, watch out for these people. And then once I really started um, going to juvenile hall, that that's when I would learn about, you know, 
enemies that are, that were all over, you know, the, the north side of Orange County, which I didn't really know before. I just knew my city, you know, and I didn't really go out of it unless it was um, to the city drive. For, uh, for you guys that don't know what the city drive is, that's either Juvenile Hall or the county jail. Yeah, so, <laughs> so yeah, definitely. So, talking about the history of La Harbor and La Jolla, people ask on this channel, they want to know, because they know one of the guys on this channel, Joe, Joker, is from La Jolla. So, the history of La Harbor and La Jolla, people, 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 for those of you just briefly, it, is, uh, it, goes, beyond, it goes beyond Mike's time. Yeah. It's, it's way back. Definitely. Families, um, even in the old Gompo days, we're talking the 50s, 60s, 40s, there was families, there were orange fields and milk and cows over there. We were orange fields. So the families knew each other, married each other, and it just happened so later on that a lot of the gangs you talked about that you met in Juvenile Hall, you know, a lot of the gangs like the uh, Enanos and the Chicos that came before the Peewees and the Tiny Locos, they had beef with Fullerton and everything. So... As the time of the Pee Wees, the Tiny Locos, and everybody came, a lot of that war had simmered down, and it was more internal with the Pee Wees starting a lot of the internal wars with everybody, you know. Um, and then um, and then La Jolla, you know, La Jolla just having, you know, the, all that history, all that love, mo you know, mutual family members, it was just a trip to see... Uh, how it ignited and the and, and and the love came between all the gang members and it, and even I remember even in the eighties, late eighties and nineties, uh probably before you were even banging, mm -hmm. there was already a mutual respect with La Harbor and La Jolla, with Joker and Rolo and all these guys, you know. So it was a trip, man. There was a bond there. There was a bond there. So you said you went to Juvenile Hall? Yeah, I started going to Juvenile Hall, like, right after, you know, right after I started kicking it with the neighborhood, you know, I started getting busted right right away, right away. You know, I started going to Juvenile Hall, and after my first time at Juvenile Hall, it, it didn't stop. You know, I wasn't the type to do a couple months and get out here and, and do a couple years on probation or, or even six months out here. You know, I would I would be locked up for a couple months and, and you know, Pinos and Joplin, those are the, you know, the Orange County camps that we had back then. They're not around no more, but those are the ones that they would send us to, you know, to do our sentence in juvenile hall. It's like a camp to try to, I guess, you know, have you go to school, have you try to do good, have you, you know, get your credits for high school and, and so be it. But after I started going to juvenile hall, it didn't like I would go for three months or six months and get out, you know, for like a week and go right back. And that continued, that cycle continued for a couple of years until they finally got tired of me and sent me to uh, the California Youth Authority. Okay, so let's stop at Juvenile Hall real quick. How was it in there? Did you see other guys from the harbor and enemies? And if so, how was that? I did. I did. It was, I, you know, I would see, you know, a few homeboys here and there, but mostly it was, it was, uh, um, it was enemies. Most of the time it was enemies and, and pretty much you're just fighting. You're just fighting all the time. It, it, it becomes, you know, a, a way of life where it's just, it ain't no thing, you know, you just, you just fight. That's basically what it is. It's the same routine over and over. Hey, homie, where are you from? And pra pa pa, pa you know, this your neighborhood, and and you know you're fighting. You get pepper sprayed, shower you off, and right back to yourself. It's basically that's that's what the get down was, you know. It's crazy, man. Yeah. Why, why'd you go to Youth Authority? What was the crime? I went to Youth Authority. They basically um, threw the book at me, right? And I and I actually went from San Bernardino County. Um, I was out there. My mom. Um, was over there and I went to go chill with her for, uh, you know, I was trying to actually like evade probation, you know, and just try to shake that, um, shake the system. But I went, I went over there and I got busted over there and they considered it like throwing the, uh, throwing the book at me and I got busted over there for, um, for an assault. Man. Yeah. So walking up to youth authority, was it a different animal than juvenile hall? 
It was. It was June of Hall times 100. Um, but there was a lot more, I guess, everybody thought they were older there, you know, where, where in Juvenile Hall, where everybody knew they were young and stupid, you know? And in YA, driving up to YA, it's just a different, like you said, a different animal, a different beast. And it's it's really like, you know, you you get in these situations and it keeps and once you learn about like the rules and and there's a lot of rules in YA oh man so many right and once you once you learn them you find yourself really the the rules that you said oh man this is stupid that's dumb you know why this after a while you find yourself really um um now you're the one enforcing them everybody's enforcing them now you know you really uh you're enforcing the rules that you first thought, you know, that were stupid. And a lot of them are righteous. They're just about respect and respect your boundaries, respect other people. But um, a lot of other ones, you know, they were they were off the wall, you know, like don't eat the red apples or something like that, you know, just because, you know, like I said, you know, that's just that's that was the beast of, of the of the moment, you know. And I went in actually, I only went in with. I think 13 months, but I had a max, a max amount of five years. It's different. And why from why in state prison, why is still under the old, old law of prison where no matter how much time you're doing, you have to go to board to get let out. Right. And that's why when I was in Hawaii, that was still the, um, you know, the law that they were under. So I actually went only with 13 months and uh, I ended up maxing out and doing five years because of everything that I was involved in. And I remember um, I was in the reception center of SRCC. That's the reception center for YA. It's right here in Norwalk. And I remember my dad coming to visit me. Um, and he came. And, and like I said, every every time that I was in juvenile hall, every time that I was busted, my dad was always my my. You know, the faithful, the one that I was, that was always there, you know. He was always writing me, visiting me, you know. He, he would tell me, like, man, you know, I don't know if I had warrants or not, but I came, you know. And, and you know, it didn't matter to him if he got busted or whatever, whatever it was, you know, he would come and see me. And, you know, he came to see me my first visit in Norwalk. And he pulled me out and he told me straight up like how much how much time do you got me on you're in the kind of the big leagues now you know you're in the you're in the minor leagues you know you're not in the big leagues yet but you're not you know in uh in single a double a no more you know you're in the minor leagues um how much time are you gonna do you know and even though i had a release date of like 13 months later or something i, I told him you know i'm gonna do five years and he told me, just don't, just don't tell me you're going to come home in three years and not come home, you know. And I told him not that I'm going to come home in five years, you know. He's like, that's all I needed to hear, you know. That's, that's all I wanted to know. And so, you know, I kind of gave myself that, um, that leeway to keep on messing up and to, and to keep on doing what I was doing, you know. It wasn't going to stop, especially in Hawaii. That's when, you know... I guess you you shine your best. I guess as as a young gang member fighter, you know, with the business. I guess. And when you, so take me back to your first day. You get to wherever you're going. Your first uh, your first place. I don't know where was it. Where was a where did you go after Norwalk? I went to Paso Robles. So you go to Paso Robles. Tell me about your first few days. Like, uh, did you right away get hooked up with your homies from OC, or how well, was it in there? And then tell us about after that, was there infighting with the South? And then was there fighting with the Norteños or what? Okay, I went to um, my first institution I hit in Y is called Paso Robles, right? El Paso de Robles. It's like Central California, San Luis Obispo area. And uh, I remember getting there off the bus and I remember a, a few homies, you know, that I was always in Juana Hall with I, they were always, you know, faces that I would see. Um, Lazy from King Street, um, Animal from uh from Greenleaf, uh Huntington Beach, um not not Greenleaf, Amberleaf. Amberleaf. 
Um, you know, and I would always see these guys in Juvenile Hall and, and now they're there too, you know, and this is, and we drive up to like a reception center inside of, um, you know, like orientation. And I remember getting off the bus and, and right away, you know, it, Orange County has always been tight, you know, even as kids, even as kids like that, right away, you know, I get off the bus, you know, different homies from the county come and introduce themselves and, and they tell me. And um, I remember going to the chow hall for the first time. I go to the chow hall and I see my first, uh, my first Sally in, in, uh, that I went to juvenile hall. My first Sally, he was from Little Town. I called him uh, Little Man, Little Man from Little Town, right? And uh, no, Little Joe from Little Town. And he goes, oh man, what's up? You made it, you know? Like if it was a big thing, I was like, yeah. And he's, okay, I'll shoot you, you know, I'll shoot you the rundown later. And uh, so it was like, it was kind of just like a reunion, you know, as crazy as it might seem, you know, it was just a reunion of, of young, young gang members, young, young, you know, young, uh, young dudes with the business, you know, and uh, I remember getting there and I remember my first incident, I was on my, I was on the phone and I was calling uh, my homeboy PD, right? And I was trying to get in contact with them. Uh, through some girl and I rem remember being on the phone with with, uh, with the girl getting ready to talk to him and uh, and some guy behind me you know he was a different race and he tried to phone check me and basically he was just trying to test me you know and the rules at that time were if you get down with another race you could get down one on one you could fight one on one but once you hit the floor he hits the floor and and feet start coming out, that's when, you know, the whole thing busts into a riot. But I remember getting into it with him, and he went to his cell, and I ran in his cell. And uh, I remember running in, running in his cell, getting him up, and the cops were, like, right after us. It seemed like they got there quick, you know, and, and that was my first incident. And uh, it was Unit Arroyo in El Paso Robles. Man, did you guys... uh? So you get in there, whatever. Was there uh, Norteños? And no, not that. No, there. no, not at Paso Robles. There was no Norteños, no Bulldogs. Um, it was just, um, yeah, no, there was none. There was none. So, mm -hmm. there, so uh, did you ever go anywhere in the YA that uh, where you ran into them, or was it always they kept them separate at that time. They kept them separate. They kept them separate because, you know, years prior to this, you know, of course they have like little seasons where they would throw them in and see what happens. And, and, but there's just, there's way too much influence from the state, you know, from prison that goes into YA, you know, cause of course, you know, when we talk about generations upon generation, you know, if you're a gang member, you know, most likely your little brother's going to be a gang member, you know. And once you hit prison, he's going to be in YA or, or something like that. Your little primo, your, you know, your cousin, your big cousin, however it is. And, and some way through the wires, you know, it's going to get back to them like, look, this is the get down up here. You guys need to follow suit, you know. And being a more than eager, you know, to, to listen to, you know, to listen to your family, you know, more than eager to listen to the homies, you're gonna, you know, follow suit. Yeah, trip out, man. And then, so you go through YA. Did you ever, uh, did you ever hit the state prisons of California? And if so, um, how was that? I did actually. I I did in YA. I did from 1998, and I got out in 2003. Um, I got out in 2003, and I continued to. Um, you know, do a little time in, here and there. And in 2005, actually, I caught a case and I, and I caught, um, I caught a, a string of armed robberies and with uh, gang enhancements. And so I was in the county jail. I was fighting uh, 52 to life. And I fought it for about a year and a half. And um, every time I went to court, they were saying, no deal, no deal. You're going to get washed up. And I was still young. You know, I was about... 21, 22 at the time, um, about to turn 23, and, you know, they're coming coming at me with all this time, and I'm like, man, you know, what's this all about, 
So I fought it until, you know, and everybody around me, you know, everybody that's been in prison. I, at this time, I hadn't been in prison yet. And everybody around me was like, man, if they come at you with the deal, you better take it, you know. So they came at me. I was about to pick jury, you know. Whenever you're fighting a case and the day you pick jury, from there on out, it's like it's real now. It's getting real, you know. And But that's but that's also the time that they're going to come at you with, with like, the best offers, you know. Because they don't want to go to trial. They don't want to spend money, you know, the time and effort it. it you know, it takes to put someone in trial is it's a lot, you know, people don't realize it, but it's a lot. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of, um, you know, people that are doing jury duty, you know, uh, time off work, taxpayers money. So they really don't want to take you to trial. But, you know, so they came at me with um, 17 years, four months and I took it. I jumped, jumped on it quick. You know, my brother was in prison at the time. My mom was in prison at the time, um, you know, so, and my dad's just on the outside, like, man, you know, you know, I hope, really hope this goes good. And my brother was writing me from the joint and he was telling me like, look, if they come at you with 20 years, you know, so I always had that, that number in my mind, 20 years, you know, if they come at me with 20 years, I'm going to take it. And they came at me with 17 years. So, you know, I hopped on it quick and they couldn't sense me that day for some reason and i thought they were playing me because you know my lawyer had me sign the um you know the the plea agreement and basically they revoked the plea that day because it was too late in the day and i'm like wait 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 a minute you know i basically told the judge already that i'm guilty you know and you know not really knowing too much in depth about the law at the time i just thought they were trying to play me you know and I went to court the next day and the offer got better. I had already, you know, signed it. I didn't have to sign again, but it got um, somewhere along the lines, the time that they were trying to um, add up the 17 years, it didn't add up. And they, I guess it was against the law. So they gave me 12 years and I was like, okay, even better. And um, they gave me 12 years with two years credit. So I had 10 to go, I was happy. And so, yeah, so that's, that's when I went, um, what was the charge and what was the charge? A string of, string of armed robberies and gang enhancements. Wow. Were you doing them yourself? Yeah. You know, so you were, you were writing solo or? No, no. I did a few by myself and a few with, um, you know, different homeboys. But at the time, you know, the cops were trying to, um, insinuate that I did it with this person, did it with that person. And I wasn't, you know, I wasn't going for the old okie doke. And, you know, I just basically said, you know, I did all these myself. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't even know these people, you know. I have no idea what, what you're talking about. I didn't have no crimes. Um, so, yeah. So you drive up. You drive up to prison. Obviously, you go through reception. Yeah. You get to where you're going. What was your first join? And, um, you know, how was that? How was that? And, and uh, again, did you, did you ride with OC? And then... Uh, what, what was going on in the yard, man? Yeah, so I, I drive up to um, Wasco State Prison. I rolled up to D Yard, right? And and at this time, D Yard was, um, it was slammed down for some reason. You know, we were on lockdown for some reason. I didn't really see no sunlight at the time. Um, it was all, you know, cell feeding, no day room, no yard. And after about, you know, a month and a half, couple months, um, the A Yard, the A Yard, um, that was DR. So A yard, if you were getting lucky, they were gonna send you to A yard. So A yard was half um half reception and the other half was just you know regular, like I think it was like a level three yard GP. Um so we would feed them. So we were like basically the um the the crew that would um uh work, right? And that would be our reception center. So I got lucky and I went to A yard, you know, and we had like I think reception had like three buildings, you know, and, and um, mainline had like two, I think two. And they were like the, um, you know, the workers for the rest of the joint, for rest, rest of Wasco. So I liked it. It was cool, you know, it was cool. I just couldn't wait to get into, um, you know, on a regular mainline with my regular blues, you know, because being in those oranges, is like, man, you don't got, you know, you don't got nothing, you know, you're kind of just 
just going with the flow into whatever yard you go to, you know. And then I finally get my Transpac bag, and I went to, um, I went to, I remember I got my bag, and it had a big old um, CTF on it. I'm like, what's CTF, you know? And at the time, my points were 48. I remember clear as day because, you know, I got, uh, they, they really did a number on me. I had 48 points, and that was um, level three, borderline, you know. And I roll up to, so I went to Solidad. I went to um, the North Yard at the time. This was in 2006, right? Uh, I went to the North Yard and and uh, I was there for about a week, maybe a week and a half. I'm over there trying to find me a celly, you know, from, from the area because that's usually, you know, the get downs on the, on the lower levels, you know. I was kind of getting schooled to, you know, the... You know, like you said, the OC boys and, and everything like that. And the day I found me a good celly, they told me I had to go back to um, committee. And usually, you know, I had already been to committee. Right after you get to a joint, you usually got to go to committee for them to clear you for yard. You know, it's just the routine you go through. Um, clear you for yard, clear you for this, clear you for this, clear you for that, you know. So, and, and they came and tell me I had to go to committee again. And I was like, why you know i already went to committee so i'm asking you know the homies there you know like hey what's um you know why would i be going to committee again and everybody's like man i don't know something must be wrong with your points or your um uh, file or something right like okay well i don't i don't think of nothing but okay so i went to committee and they tell me they're giving me 50 more points and i'm like what for what and they said that all the write-ups that i had in y it's following me and I'm like, oh, man, that's, you know, that's crazy. So now I got, you know, near 100 points. And I got to go to a, a four yard now. And I got to go to the hole. As a matter of fact, I got to go to the hole because now I'm a threat to a level three yard. You know, now I have, um, I have almost 100 points and that's level four. And you can no longer be on a um, level three yard you're a threat to the yard. And I'm like, what? I It's like I barely got to prison, you know? How am I a threat to prison? I barely got to prison. How, how am I a threat to the yard? And I tried to, you know, I tried to argue my way out of it. And they were like, no, you need to go to the hole right now. And it, and there was a lieutenant there. He, he was kind of seasoned, you know, he's been around for a long time. And there was a counselor and they wanted to actually cuff me up right there in the, um, in the in the office and escort me to the hall and i i kind of jumped up like you're not you're not taking me from here you know because you know all my homies are on the yard i'm not walking out of here and at the time it was like you know a lot of people were i guess you could say um they were locking it up right to be blunt right they were locking it up they were going pc they're going s and y you know for whatever reason right so I knew that if I walked, even though there was nothing wrong with, with my case, you know, but I told the lieutenant, I'm not walking out of here unless, you know, like I'm going in, in with some pepper spray, you know, at least let me get, go back to the yard, explain to the homies and, you know, that I'm, that I'm going to the hole. And, uh, you know, cause I was, you know, I was, I was fresh to the yard. So I was like, I didn't know what to do. I was new to prison. So the lieutenant was like, I get you, man. I get you. I understand, you know? Yeah, that's cool. You know, so I went, you know, I got out of the office. I went and told one of the homies on the yard and he was like, oh, yeah, this happens all the time. You know, me not knowing like, you know, because I'm kind of like nervous, you know, what are they going to think? And, you know, <laughs> what's going to are they going to run my name through the mud? You know, and, and little did I know it happens all the time. So I was like, OK, cool. So I went to the hole, I stayed in the hole for like, man, for like four or five months just to get a bed in, um, in a level four yard. And yeah, I went to um, Kern Valley State Prison. Man, was there any, uh, anybody from your hood there or anybody from OC? In, in level four? Solidad? In the level four? No, there wasn't. There wasn't. No, not at that time. There wasn't. Um, you know, I would hear different names here and there. Hey, do you know your home by this? Yeah. You know, but um, there wasn't nobody there. I went to Kern Valley State Prison, A Yard at the time. This was like end of 06, 07. 
Wow. Yeah. Wow. Was there already um, the gangs like called the Two Fivers and stuff like that? Was Were those guys already around or no? We didn't hear it. Like, we didn't hear it as much. I just knew that, you know, the homies were telling me that a lot of people are going PC. And, you know, for whatever reason on their own, you know, the SNY yards and, you know, just to just to watch out because when we were in the hall, you know. So that's kind of where I got laced up when I was in solid that hall. We had group yard, you know, all the homies. And they would kind of lace me up about, you know, these new uh, PC gangs and to watch out because they will get you. Uh, okay, so, I mean, they're, I guess they were around, you know, but very, very, um, you didn't hear them as much as towards the end of my term, you know. So if, you ask, if somebody asked you, what was the craziest thing you ever seen in prison? What was the craziest thing or the most violent thing you ever seen in prison? Oh, man, stabbings. A lot of stabbings, man. A lot of stabbings. I remember, um, I actually remember my first stabbing that I saw on the yard. And, um, you know, one that I actually saw with my own eyes. Because you would hear, you would come in from yard and you would hear, oh, you know, someone got whacked out there. Someone got whacked. But that the first one that I actually saw was... Um, you know, was in was right there in um, New Delano, and one of the homies uh, from the area, as a matter of fact, he came and pulled me to the side. He's like, "Hey, just just step over here, you know, step over here and and watch that way." Like, okay, and I watched that way, and you know, some some guy was getting whacked. He was he was an older dude, tall, skinny, and and he was getting whacked by something like the size of a ruler, you know? And I was like, man, that's like, how do they, I was thinking to myself, how do they even like get that out here? But yeah, it was, it was, you know, homie on homie, you know, basically two homies on another homie and they were just blasting them. And I remember um, when they blasted him in the neck, um, it started squirting, you know, with every, with every heart, you know, beat. It seemed like it was just squirting and squirting. And honestly,